um, I'm just going to start recording there, Brian. There's a Confederate refuge that was written by uh, Mr. Rusher, uh, and that's the only one that we've identified some Confederate locations in town. And he, it's a very, it's almost a bit of a survey. It's not as in depth as the work that yes, you've done. Yes, I think um, I've, I think that's one of the things I've used for my research. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so the Niagara Historical Society has rights to that, and we publish that one for in-house. Um, okay. Super. Um, so maybe I've, I've started recording and what we'll do is we will get started here. Okay, let me pull up my notes here. So good morning, everyone. Again, uh, I'm Sarah Kaufman with the Niagara Lake Museum here to welcome you to today's lecture. We will be recording today's lecture and uploading it to our YouTube channel. So if for any reason you can't stay for the whole talk, you will be sent the link to the recording. And as always, there will be time for questions at the end. So feel free to use the chat box and the Q&A functions. And if you want to support our free lecture, virtual lecture series, our other programming or our collections, I will post a link in the chat box where you can make a donation. Today, we welcome our speaker, Brian Martin, author of From Underground Railroad to Rebel Refuge, Canada and the Civil War, published by ECW Press of Toronto. Brian was an award-winning journalist for more than 40 years, telling the stories of Southwestern Ontario. He has written two, uh, two true crime books, several biographies and baseball histories, and is a member of two historical societies. He lives in London, Ontario. And today we are going to hear about Canada and the Civil War opening eyes in Niagara and beyond. And I will turn it over to you, Brian, if you want to start to share your screen. Thank you and welcome everyone. I'm glad, glad that you're here. Now, I believe if I've got this right, I have to hit the share screen, right, uh, Sarah? Yeah, here we go. And then, there we are, okay. May I assume that everyone can see the opening slide of my presentation that says opening Canadian eyes about a foreign war? I can see it, Brian, so you're all set. Okay, here we go, okay. It's been estimated that more than 60,000 books have been written about the Civil War, its battles, its characters, causes, and legacy. Only a handful of them deal with the surprising involvement of Canada and Canadians in the fight that pitted the North against the South and which led to the loss of more than 620,000 lives. In Canada, we tend to think of the Civil War as an internecine struggle that, waged, that was waged in another land and dealt with issues that were foreign to us, such as slavery. But that was not the case. From a vantage point just across the border, the British colonies were more than interested spectators, much more. I hope to, I hope to open some eyes today about the role of Canada and Canadians in the terrible conflict that gripped our neighbor to the south and how the Civil War had an impact on Canada. You'll recognize this, I'm sure. This is the Niagara Parkway just north of Queenston. An historic plaque here marks an important turning point in the history of the province. But motorists whizzing past likely miss it. And that is of course the Niagara River with New York State on the other side. The historic plaque commemorates Chloe Cooley, an enslaved black woman whose rough handling by her Canadian enslaver and sailed to an American across the Niagara River prompted Upper Canada's governor, John Graves Simcoe, and the Colonial Assembly in 1793 to pass the first legislation to bring about an end to enslavement in the British Empire. It wasn't until 1834, however, that Britain abolished slavery, freeing about 800,000 persons across the empire. Its colony of Upper Canada was years ahead of the motherland. Just this month, Black History Month, Canada Post issued a stamp featuring Chloe Cooley. So her important contribution to Canadian history is beginning to be recognized. As for her fate, we have no idea what happened to her after she was forced to cross the river that March day of 1793. John Graves Simcoe strongly opposed slavery, but several members of the legislature of Upper Canada were enslavers. So a complete and immediate ban of enslavement was not politically possible. Shortly after the Chloe Cooley incident, Simcoe persuaded the legislature to pass an act to limit slavery, which would see the practice gradually phased out and gone completely in 25 years. Upon learning about this development in Upper Canada and subsequent British anti-slavery legislation, 
many runaway enslaved persons, along with free black men and women, began fleeing north to find freedom. Within a few years, the Underground Railroad was in operation, relying on a network of activists to help freedom seekers on their way. Major border crossing points were at Windsor and Fort Erie. The American Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 marked an important turning point. Under that legislation, northern states were required to return formerly enslaved persons to the south and bounty hunters tracked them down. This significantly enhanced traffic to Canada on the Underground Railroad as the enslaved population in the United States reached 4 million. A bit of background now about black settlements that were established in what is now Ontario. The first settlement was intended for black soldiers who fought for Britain in the War of 1812. It was created at Oro along Lake Simcoe just north of Barrie in 1815. This map of Oro Township shows farmland which was allocated to the new arrivals. Only an ancient church survives there today. The black population at Oro reached about 100 before many settlers moved to more fertile lands in the southwest of the province near Chatham. In 1829, black men and women who fled race riots and discrimination in Cincinnati settled at Wilberforce, a community they founded just north of London. <clears throat> Like Oro, Wilberforce was not successful and little remains of either settlement today. This mural commemorating the Wilberforce settlement was recently unveiled in downtown Lucan, the town which now occupies the site of the former black community. Colonial Governor Sir John Colburn was anxious to provide a home for black people in Upper Canada, which needed settlers. He famously announced, we do not know people by their color. Should you come, you will be entitled to the privileges of the rest. That included voting if they owned land, the same right enjoyed by landowning white men of the day. Colburn's words of welcome are featured on the mural in Lucan. Bertie Hall is located in the north end of today's Fort Erie, not far from the former ferry crossing from Buffalo. It became a first stop for black travelers upon their arrival in Canada. Here they were provided with food, clothing, accommodation, and help finding permanent living quarters and employment. Bertie Hall's key role in welcoming newcomers is noted on a plaque near the front door. Josiah Henson was a man among the many black men and women who crossed into Canada at Fort Erie. Henson was born into slavery in Maryland and made his way to Fort Erie in 1830. He became a conductor for the Underground Railroad and led nearly 120 others to freedom. In 1841, Henson also helped to establish the successful Dawn Settlement near Dresden at the western end of Upper Canada. Henson's life became the basis of the novel Uncle Tom's Cabin, written by abolitionist Harriet Beecher Stowe, an important and influential anti-slavery book that sold extremely well. Evidence suggests that the United States President Abraham Lincoln was heavily influenced by Uncle Tom's Cabin when he formulated the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863. Henson's former house, known as Uncle Tom's Cabin, is located at the Provincial Historic Site in Dresden that now bears Henson's name. His final resting place is just a few meters away. The Elgin Settlement at Buxton was established in 1849, southwest of Chatham. It was a particularly successful black farming community of about 1,200 residents. This cabin at North Buxton is typical of those built by settlers. Also found in North Buxton is this school that replaced an earlier structure. Newcomers believed in the value of a good education, something that had been denied them back home in the South. Education was seen as the key to improving their lives and the school was one of the first buildings they erected. The quality of education provided by the Buxton School and its teachers was so good that neighboring white children attended it for many years. This image is taken outside the school shortly after 1900. Reverend William King, the white Presbyterian minister who founded the settlement at Buxton, erected St. Andrew's Church in South Buxton in 1859. In the distance along A.D. Shad Road is North Buxton and the National Historic Site erected, located there. The settlement at Buxton was established on 9,000 acres of heavily forested land that the, the, that the newcomers had to clear to begin farming. Harriet Tubman, born enslaved in Maryland like Henson, 
was an anti-slavery activist and personally helped many black freedom seekers travel along the Underground Railroad. She spent more than a decade based in St. Catharines, then a town of about 6,000 with a black community of 800 centered on Geneva and North Streets. In 1862, she returned to the United States where she became a nurse and a spy for the Union side. Tubman's Church in St. Catharines, from which she worked, is an historic site today known as Salem Chapel. In Chatham, during a secretive conference in 1858, anti-slavery zealot John Brown announced his plans to overthrow the American government and abolish enslavement entirely. He visited several communities across southwestern Ontario, including London and St. Catharines, drumming up support and raising funds to finance his plan. In 1859, he launched his disastrous raid at Harpers Ferry, Virginia, in which several Canadians participated. Ten of his followers, including Canadian Stuart Taylor, were killed. For his part, Brown was executed. <laughs> Newly elected United States President Abraham Lincoln had not yet been sworn in when South Carolina became the first state to secede from the Union in December of 1860, an act which was one of the factors leading to the Civil War. Lincoln's Secretary of State, William Seward, had often suggested annexing Canada thereby making few, friend, few friends for the North. Fear of possible Northern aggression produced sympathy for the South in Canada. A young man from Southwestern Ontario, Jasper Wolverton was among the first Canadians to die in the Civil War. He signed up to be a te teamster for the Union Army along with three of his brothers because of the high wages offered. Jasper died in 1861 and lies on a hill overlooking the family home in the hamlet east of Woodstock which bears the family name. In all, it's been estimated as many as 7,000 Canadians may have died south of the border. Medical doctor Solomon Secord of Kincardine, Ontario had just moved to South Carolina when the Civil War broke out. He was a grand nephew of Laura Secord, uh, the heroine in the War of 1812. Secord became a surgeon for the Confederacy and tended to the wounded at Gettysburg where he himself was wounded and then captured. He returned to Kincardin after the war where he was so beloved that upon his death, friends raised funds to erect a monument to honor him. For the longest time, this was the only monument in Canada to a Canadian who served in the Confederacy. In 2017, another marker was erected just west of Cornwall by Civil War reenactors to salute all Canadians who served on both sides of the conflict. New Brunswick native Sarah Edmonds wanted to become a nurse for the Union Army at a time when women were still considered too delicate to act as nurses, despite the success of British nurse Florence Nightingale in the Crimean War. Edmonds passed herself off as a man, Franklin Thompson, and was never detected. One has to wonder how rigorous the physicals were for recruits at the time. Apparently, they were little more than a handshake. Sarah Edmonds became a spy and later wrote about her exploits, but never revealed her deception. Overall, only a handful of women saw service in the Civil War. It is noteworthy. It is noteworthy, so to speak, that Calixa Lavallee, composer of O Canada, also enlisted in the Union Army. As Attorney General for Canada, John A. Macdonald was alarmed at the presence of, of American crimps in Canada, operatives who lured young men south across the border with all sorts of promises and inducements, and then enlisted them. Crimps ignored the border and were paid for their efforts by American authorities, anxious to replenish troops lost in battle. Macdonald, later, be, later to become Canada's first Prime Minister, instituted fines in a bid to curb the practice, but they had little impact. London was the bustling industrial, commercial, and agricultural hub of Western Ontario by the 1860s and profited handsomely by selling to both sides in the conflict just a few miles to the south. The city was full of buyers, spies, and fugitives from the war who filled the streets and occupied rooms in city hotels. Some newcomers, draft dodgers, then known as skedaddlers, and others found work in local businesses and on nearby farms. Most would have arrived at London's Grand Trunk Railway Station. The Tecumseh House Hotel was the finest in London and proved popular with Southerners, including some families who lived there during the war. Confederate spies also patronized the hotel. Northern operatives and buyers preferred Arkell's Hotel, 
nearby whose extensive stables could house the horses they purchased in large numbers for the war effort. The Confederacy approved a plan to undermine the Union from bases in Canada. About $600,000 was allocated to commissioners Jacob Thompson and Clement Clay to launch clandestine efforts intended to, to divert Union interest and its army to the northern frontier, thereby providing some relief to Confederates under fire in the south. Thompson set up shop in Toronto at the Queen's Hotel and Clay in Montreal at the St. Lawrence Hotel, which served mint juleps, a drink favored by Southerners. Neither man liked the other, however, and both had trouble keeping secrets from Northern spies who monitored their activities and managed to thwart some of them. One plot hatched in Montreal was to spread yellow fever among Northern cities. Architect of the plan was Kentucky doctor Luke P. Blackburn, who had previously worked with patients suffering from the often fatal disease in Bermuda and elsewhere. Blackburn distributed clothing in the North that was once worn by patients, which he believed was contaminated with yellow fever. His scheme failed, however, because the disease cannot be transmitted by such physical contact. Otherwise, a highly respected doctor, Blackburn was elected governor of Kentucky after the war. Also hatched in Montreal was a plan by John Wilkes Booth to assassinate United States President Abraham Lincoln. So too was the daring Confederate raid on St. Albans, Vermont. Upon his release from a Union prison, former Confederate President Jefferson Davis um, settled in Montreal and then in Lenoxville, where his two sons attended school. Davis received widespread displays of support when he appeared in public and traveled to places like Toronto and today's Niagara-on-the-Lake. These portraits of Davis, wife Farina, and their children were taken in Montreal in 1867. York County in the upper reaches of South Carolina was a hotbed of Confederate fervor during the Civil War. Many prominent citizens joined the ranks of the Southern Army, especially in Yorkville, today known as York. Rose's Hotel in Yorkville, South Carolina was built in the early 1850s by local medical doctor J. Rufus Bratton, whose family owned several plantations in the area. The doctor lived next door to the hotel. When Confederate President Jefferson Davis was fleeing westward to avoid capture by Union forces in the dying days of the Civil War, he stayed overnight with Bratton, while his accompanying men, including Secretary of War John C. Breckinridge, took rooms at the hotel. From one of its balconies, Breckinridge urged York County residents to keep up the fight for the South. Dr. J. Rufus Bratton was a prominent figure in Yorkville. He served as a surgeon in the Confederate Army and after the war became a leading figure in the new Ku Klux organization that sought to suppress black people and keep them from exercising their newfound right to vote. Bratton was charged with terrorism and murder for his activities with the white supremacist group. He found his way to Canada, ultimately settling in London where others from South Carolina had already found refuge. Long before the Civil War, the small town of Niagara, today known as Niagara on the Lake as we know, attracted British Empire loyalists, some of whom brought enslaved persons with them. Free Black loyalists also settled there. Later, formerly enslaved persons in the United States and free Black people reached the border community after traveling along the Underground Railroad. The Black population eventually reached about 200 in the town of about 2,000. Homes owned or rented by Black settlers are superimposed on a map of the community today. Their proximity to the American border created problems for Black inhabitants, however, and many moved farther inland. Bounty hunters from the South could easily slip across the border and apprehend them before anyone knew what had happened. Among the Black arrivals who built modest homes in Niagara were William and Susanna Stewart, who moved westward to Galt in 1847. Another reminder of the Black population that once called Niagara on the Lake home is this small burial ground in the northerly part of the old town. Only a few headstones remain. The cemetery is being renamed and a movement is afoot to provide markers and uncover stones for others who also lie there. After the Civil War, the town of Niagara became a favorite destination for former Confederate generals and other officials who chose flight to Canada. Had they remained in the United States, they may have been branded as traitors and faced retaliation or even execution. John C. Breckinridge occupied two homes during his time in Niagara, as did James Mason, the former Confederate envoy to Britain. General Jubal Early also lived here briefly. Major J.W. Avery, a leading figure in South Carolina's York County Ku Klux organization, 
who was wanted for murder, fled to Canada a bit later, later and stayed in Niagara much longer. The first prominent Confederate to appear was Ni New Orleans cleric William T. Leacock, followed by Nashville banker John Porterfield. And the numbers on the map are in chronological order of their arrival in uh, Niagara. John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky was vice president of the United States immediately before the Civil War. He ran against Abraham Lincoln for president in 1860 and lost, obviously. Breckinridge became a leading Confederate general and was the last Secretary of War for Jefferson Davis. Aside from Davis, Breckinridge was among several top Confederates to find refuge in Canada until they were pardoned and felt it was safe to return home. Breckinridge rented his fine home on Front Street in Niagara, which I understand is called the Captain's House, from which he could see Fort Niagara of the Americans directly across the Niagara River. Every morning he could hear the bugle call rousing soldiers there from their sleep. And after about a year, Breckenridge and his family took an extended trip to Europe, then returned to the peaceful town they had so enjoyed. Upon their return from Europe, the Breckenridges moved up Front Street a bit to this home, which they occupied until they returned to the South late in 1869. Local newspaper publisher William Kirby was their neighbor and often expressed sympathy for the South in his columns. During their time in Niagara, the Breckenridges played host to family and friends who visited. The Niagara region was well known to Southerners before the Civil War when the wealthier ones sought places to escape in summertime heat. Breckenridge is standing on the left of this photo that has the American Falls as a backdrop. James Mason, the Confederacy's envoy to Britain during the Civil War was persuaded to settle in Niagara by other Confederates already living there. This is one of two homes he rented, both of which became gathering places for Confederates living in Niagara and for those who visited. Jefferson Davis stayed with Mason and his family briefly in 1867. During the visit, a local band serenaded him with the tune Dixie, and he publicly thanked Canada and Britain for his fine reception. Others who visited their compatriots in Niagara were Charles Helm, the Confederate envoy to Cuba, and Generals John Bell and John Preston excuse me, John Bell Hood and John Preston. General Jubal Early spent time in Niagara as well as in Toronto where he published his memoirs. He was one of the first high-ranking Confederates to seek refuge in Canada by way of Mexico and Cuba. Confederate Major J.W. Avery was a wanted man back in Carolina with, re with a reward of $60,000 posted for his capture. He fled during his trial for terrorism and murder related to his activities in the Ku Klux Klan in the Yorkville area. After a brief stay in London, Avery moved east to Niagara, where he bought this fine house and still owned it upon his death many years later in Virginia. Other Southerners rented homes in Niagara rather than buy them, hoping their stay would be brief. South Carolina was primarily agricultural with large plantations where cotton and rice were grown. The low-lying wetlands near the Atlantic coast were particularly suited for widespread rice cultivation. Rice was the basis of the wealth of the Charleston area, where two old families descended from the Huguenots were among those who prospered, the Manigaults and the Mazics. They became community leaders and several were elected to the state legislature. Joseph Manigault was a wealthy man and built a substantial house in Charleston, which was de designed by his architect brother. It was here that Gabriel Manigault was born in 1808. Gabriel became a South Carolina state legislator who voted to secede from the Union in late 1860. Joining him in that crucial vote was fellow legislator Alexander Mazik, to whom he was related through marriage. The secession of South Carolina in December of 1860 was one of the precipitating factors in the Civil War. In the Civil War. And the Joseph Manigault House, pictured here, is now a museum. After a brief time in Yorkville, a town that in the northern reaches of the state, Gabriel Manigault and his family fled to Canada in 1869 and they were attracted to London, where their relatives Edward and Alexander Mazik had already settled for reasons that are not entirely clear. The Manigaults chose to live in this modest home at 300 Piccadilly Street before moving to the more impressive 808 Waterloo Street nearby. Upon reaching London, many Southerners stayed at the boarding house operated by Sarah Hill at 843 Wellington Street before finding more permanent accommodation elsewhere. Next door, 
is 849 Wellington, where three nieces of Gabriel Manigault lived out the rest of their lives. Dr. J. Rufus Bratton of Yorkville in South Carolina was staying at Sarah Hill's boarding house and was new to London when he was abducted off the street in June of 1872 and taken back south to face charges of terrorism and murder under the Ku Klux Act of 1871. When Bratton returned to London following international uproar at his treatment and the violation of Canadian sovereignty, he and his family occupied this home at 262 Piccadilly Street and he established a flourishing medical practice downtown. Bratton was a very popular physician in the city because of his superior training and experience tending to the wounded on the battlefields of the Civil War. Bratton and his family returned to South Carolina in 1879. Many refugees from South Carolina lived a few doors apart in North London, just south of today's St. Joseph's Hospital. Most of their homes are still standing, although heavily modified over the years. Dr. J. Rufus Bratton, who we met earlier, became a leader of the white supremacist Ku Klux organization in Yorkville, South Carolina, after the Civil War. He worked alongside Major G.W. Avery, who ranked higher in the organization that terrorized Black people and resorted to violence to keep them from exercising their new newfound right to vote and to bear arms. Bratton was implicated in the murder of a Black militia leader and promptly fled town, becoming a wanted man. Back in London, following his, his improper abduction, he became a popular fellow. Bratton's decision to turn to the South several years later was regretted by his many friends he made in the city who threw him lavish going away parties. Here, Bratton appears in an 1872 photo taken in London wearing his Scottish Rites uniform of the Freemasons. The headstones of the South Carolinians who made London their home can be found in Woodland Cemetery in a section known as Millionaire's Row because so many prominent citizens are interred there. They, incl they include the beer brewing Labatt's along with the Harris and Beecher families. That tall cylindrical marker at the back indicates the Labatt family plot and the proximity of the Southerners to members of the city elite suggests they had been accepted by them. And those are not dandelions, those are little yellow dots indicating the headstones of the South Carolinians in Woodland Cemetery. Their, their headstones in Woodland Cemetery note that the Mazics and Manigaults were born in Charleston, South Carolina. The stone at the lower left is that of William, son of Gabriel and Anne Manigault, who became a land surveyor and moved to nearby Strathroy, where he married a local woman. His marker can be found in that town cemetery. Also lying in sprawling Woodland Cemetery, not far from the Manigaults and Mazics, is Shadrach Martin, reputed to be the first black man to enlist in the Union Army. He had settled in London before the Civil War, but shortly before war broke out, returned to Missouri, where he was persuaded to serve on a gunboat that patrolled the Mississippi River. Martin came back to London afterwards and for many years was a popular barber favored by the city elite. His unmarked grave is indicated by the X. In York, South Carolina, formerly known as Yorkville, the hometown of several fugitives from the law who fled to Canada, can be found this massive monument to Confederate war dead. Just south of town lies Rufus Bratton in a Presbyterian cemetery near the former plantations his family once owned. Well, there's an interesting postscript to the story of the Civil War, the racism it unleashed in its aftermath, and the impact felt by Canada. In the United States, prosecutions under the federal Ku Klux Act of 1871 pushed the white supremacist organization underground, and some of its members fled to places like Canada. Overt racist sentiment would lie dormant in the South for many years. All that changed in 1915 with the release of the silent film, The Birth of a Nation, which inspired the creation of the modern Ku Klux Klan. The film, while cinematically ahead of its time, was unabashedly racist, portraying black people as ignorant and violent. Klansmen, meanwhile, were depicted as heroic saviors of the white race. The film was based on the book, The Klansman, one of whose leading characters was modeled on the author's uncle who lived in Yorkville, South Carolina, the very same Yorkville that was home to Ku Klux leaders Rufus Bratton and J.W. Avery, and for a time to the Manigaults. The opening night of the film in Atlanta was accompanied by a demonstration by the reconstituted Ku Klux Klan, the Ku Klux, now calling itself the Ku Klux Klan. Its members adopted the white sheets and headgear from the movie in a case of life imitating art. 
The Ku Klux grew quickly in the United States and began recruiting members in Ontario and elsewhere in Canada. Cross burnings, parades, and membership drives were held in Barrie, Toronto, London, Dorchester, St. Thomas, Hamilton, Belleville, Prescott, and other centers in the late 1920s and early 1930s. This rally attracted 1,000 participants to Dorchester, a village just east of London, in October of 1925. Some 200 new members were initiated at the town fairgrounds while a 40 foot tall cross burned in the darkness. And it wasn't just the boondocks that were targeted by the revived racist organization eager to recruit members north of the border. This is an image from the Toronto Star of March 1926, in which the KKK placed a wreath at the cenotaph outside City Hall in the darkness, and then saluted before silently departing. The bizarre nighttime stunt was likely intended to generate interest in the organization. The KKK found it hard going in Ontario, however, where fiercely Protestant Loyal Orange Lodge already practiced anti-Catholic, anti-French, and anti-immigrant bigotry. The Orangemen were entrenched and occupied most government posts in Ontario and in Toronto. By the time the Depression took hold, the KKK had given up on Ontario, although it continued for a time in Western Canada. The Klan retreated south of the border, where it continued to flourish. So there you have it. Canada accepted both black and white escapees from the United States before, during, and after the Civil War. Thousands of them. They came for all sorts of reasons to a convenient hideout, a safe attic, if you will, and Canadians generally accepted them. In all, about 40,000 Americans found refuge in Canada. Some put down roots, while others eventually returned to the South, lured back by the promises of reconstruction. But many Black returnees would be disappointed because of the enactment of Jim Crow laws and overt racism that sought to keep them suppressed and turn back the clock to pre-war conditions in the South. Meanwhile, about 20,000 Canadians served on both sides of the Civil War, although some estimates claim it was twice that number with as many as 7,000 of them dying in battle or from illness. The motives of Canadians to enlist were many and varied. This book of mine published by ECW Press relates the story of the two-way traffic between two countries, one of which had a unique front row seat for the existential crisis that gripped the other, but Canada and Canadians were far more than mere spectators. Canadians demonstrated some sympathy for the South, fearing that if the North prevailed in the Civil War, Washington would then turn its guns northward in a bid to complete the annexation of Canada it failed to achieve during the War of 1812. Johnny MacDonald and George Etienne Cartier successfully capitalized on that fear and the Dominion of Canada was born. So the Civil War, which tore apart the American nation, can be credited with helping forge our nation. Few Canadians seem to understand or appreciate that fact. In school, we learn precious little about the Civil War and virtually nothing about the role played by Canada and Canadians. My book is an attempt to address the intriguing ways in which North America's English speaking neighbors, children of a common mother, interacted before, during and after a particularly interesting period of our shared history. It is bound to open some eyes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Brian. That was wonderful. Uh, and if anyone is interested, that book, uh, Brian's book, is available in our gift shop. Uh, you can buy it through the online store or come and visit us in person to see it. Uh, does anyone have any questions? If you do, please put them into the chat webinar um, there. Um, so the first question that's come up, Brian, I'm just going to read it here. It says, I recall attending a historical event where it stated that of those who registered to fight in the American Civil War from Niagara, the majority enlisted to fight for the Confederate States of America. Please advise if this information is correct. Hmm. Uh, I'm not certain about that. The majority of Canadians tended to sign up for the Union side. Um, I'm not sure about, uh, and there were a number that, that went with the Confederacy. I'm not sure because records are not, are not good uh, that indicate which side, well, first of all, exactly how many Canadians went south. I took a conservative number uh, of 20,000. It's not clear exactly how many Canadians went south or were planning to go south anyway, and who went south to fight, fight in the Civil War or to make money from the Civil War. Uh, much less on which side. So 
I'm afraid I can't give you any precision on that. Um, although I would not be surprised. Uh, certain pockets, uh, uh, places of down by Windsor, there were a number of people that went and uh, they went and, and served uh, and enlisted on the southern side. So, but the majority uh, uh, who enlisted were went to the north, and there were no crimps, as they were called, crimps. Um, uh, that the Confederates sent to Canada, as far as I can tell, because they would have the trouble of, you know, scrounging up some men and then having to cross Union, the Union side to take them back to the South. So uh, the, the numbers that would have been on the Union side would have been much greater because of that as well. Thank you. The next question we have is, has the Breckenridge group picture at Niagara Falls ever been identified? So perhaps the other people in the photo, because you've identified. Before. No, uh, and it was hard for me to, to to find it. And I sort of found it after the fact. It's not I didn't get that in my book. There's a, a number of images in my presentation today that I was unaware of or could not arrange to acquire for, for use in the book because, you know, rights and payments and oh, it's a nightmare. Um, no, uh, all, all I know from the source, I found that in the state somewhere and all it said was family and friends. And so we we I don't believe there's any other. Uh, I, as best I can tell, as, as you could tell, it's a grainy image. I couldn't tell if there were other, say, Confederate generals or uh, uh, Confederate politicians in that. It, it's pretty hard to tell. And I had no information about uh, who, who, the, who the people were, aside from Breckenridge, who's a very distinctive man with a hair, uh, sort of an interesting hairstyle and forehead and stuff. And he's easy to pick out. The other ones, no, uh, no, I, no idea who they were. Thank you. Uh, the next question was, was there KKK activity in Niagara? Have there ever been any associations uh, of Confederate descendant associations in Niagara? Did you come across anything like that in your research? Uh, there were, there were um, a, 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 a large number of meetings and gatherings. Uh, I highlighted where the major ones were. There was, I mean, some, Barry had a huge cross burning up on a hill, uh, the thousand, People gathered in Dorchester. I think it was three thousand in Prescott, in eastern Ontario. Uh, I I did not come across, uh, and I'd love to know if there were. Uh, I did not come across any sort of significant events in Niagara. There may have been meetings. Uh, there were a number of ministers that sort of allied with that group. We had one just outside of London, a guy named Be Eckert, who was uh, involved with them. And then when he was found out, he says, "Well, I was acting as a, an agent for the police to infiltrate them." But uh, I don't think so. Um, so I don't know enough about uh, uh, meetings uh, or gatherings or events in the Niagara region involving the KKK. Doesn't mean they didn't happen. I just didn't come across. I was focusing in on the very significant recruiting events, uh, cross burnings and things that drew press attention. And if, if anyone has found anything about KKK um, uh, meetings or gatherings or events in Niagara, I'd uh, love to I'd love to know about it. And if they could share it with you, uh, Sarah, uh, and then perhaps you could share with me, that would be great. Of course, yeah. So I've never come across anything myself, but I haven't had the opportunity to dig into some of the newspapers of the time. And we are trying to digitize a lot of our newspapers. Um, and perhaps through that, we might find some more information. As oh, yeah. Well. Oh yeah, it's, the, the great thing about this is nuggets are always turning up. I feel like I'm a bit of a gold miner and I'm in a riverbed and I'll, I'll be rooting away and, oh, look at that. It's like I find a, a little nugget and it makes my day. I, I feel the same way often as well um, in my job. Uh, the next question we have is, is General Jubal Early's residence in Niagara-on-Lake across from the park Voices of Freedom that enables um, to, us to understand, celebrate and honor our black history? And I believe Jubal Early's was on Johnson Street. Is that correct? Yeah, it's just it's just it's just immediately to the south, I guess it is. It's right across the street. Uh, uh, I can't remember the, the names of the streets, but yeah, I've been to the Voices of that, that that monument, and I said, my goodness, Jubal Early lived right there, I mean, right next door, basically, just across the street. And I'm going, isn't that an interesting juxtaposition? It is. Yes, I I know the exact. And he. He would not be too thrilled about that that monument, I'm quite sure. And uh, I'm sure the people that were behind the monument, I don't know if they, the people who put that up, if they knew that, uh, uh, you know, one of the leading generals of the Confederacy lived right across the street. No, definitely. I think a lot of people get shocked by, um, you know, the sympathy that existed for these civil are these Confederate leaders, you know, uh, I think when Jefferson Davis came for a visit, one of the houses, you know, there was actually a big celebration. Uh, I think William Kirby writes about it in his newspaper or something along those lines, a huge celebration, 
to come and listen to his speech and all these Niagara residents. That's where the, that's where the band played. That's where the band played Dixie for him. Yeah. Yes, that's right. That was, it, that was his place. I believe that was his place at the corner of what Ricardo and Wellington. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Which I couldn't get a good picture of. It's so heavily, it's densely forested around it. I got a photo of the other place because it was more open. But yeah, that's where Jefferson Davis uh, actually came for a number of days. He attended a, 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 a fair and a number of events and played with the kids and uh, chickens and all sorts of stuff and just had a nice uh, decompressed time. And uh, But it was, the reception that Niagara gave him was, uh, was quite, quite, uh, quite warm. Definitely. It's quite shocking if you think about it as, you know, um the what was known as the colored village you know a few blocks away is where there perhaps could have been some refugees coming from the united states so it's it's quite an interesting part of our local history and i appreciate you sharing uh, your research with us today now i don't see any more questions from anyone so uh, as i mentioned to all of our attendees um, brian's book is uh, available in our gift shop thank you so much brian for sharing your research with us today we really enjoyed it our next lecture is Wednesday, March 1st at 11 a.m. Elizabeth LeBlanc, Julia uh, Krevvik, and Aaron Ronfield, who are Parks Canada staff, will present on women who broke the glass forts. I think that's uh, uh, a talk that is talking about uh, women working at uh, Parks Canada forts, which are often uh, believed to be quite male dominated. Uh, don't forget to register. The link can be found under the events calendar on our website, notlmuseum.ca. Thank you so much for everyone attending today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Just give people a minute to log out there. Oh, so one another question came up afterwards. Perhaps if you, that person sticks on, we can answer it. U.S. troops burned the town of Niagara on the lake in 1813. Could this negative experience from the War of 1812-14 have influenced the warm reception fugitive leaders uh, received in Niagara Lake after the war? Ah, that's a very interesting question. Memories are long. Um, memories are long. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a wariness uh, along the, the border where, where you live, especially uh, a great wariness of, uh, I mean, you had Fenians, you had, uh, you know, the War of 1812, you had the burning of Newark, the, uh, you had, uh, uh, of, of, excuse me, of Niagara. Uh, it, it, I, 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 it may have been, it may have been. I, not living there and not knowing it or feeling it in my bones like you folks would, I'm not sure, but I think it may have been a contributing factor. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll well, thank, thank, thank you. Uh, that was lovely. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to try next time I'm in Niagara on the Lake. I've got a good friend that just bought a place on Gate Street about three years ago, um, a gate between the main drag and Front Street. Um, and we had a little bit of a, a launch there back in November, a very invitation only launch. And uh, I'm going to be visiting her and we want to do a little trip across to the, see the Freedom Crossing over at Lewiston and then go up to Fort Niagara, as well as every time I come, she shows me a new part of Niagara that she's learning about, right, of Niagara on the Lake she's learning about. And so I'm definitely going to drop into the museum because most of my research was conducted during COVID. So I couldn't get into your museum. I couldn't get into the Buxton Museum or the Dresden Museum or the Amherstburg Museum, any of those places I really wanted to get to. But uh, I managed, I think, to pull it off despite that. And uh, But I'm definitely going to come in and say hello to you and Amy uh, next time I'm in town. That would be lovely. And our summer exhibition is about Chloe Cooley and um, our uh, slavery history here in Upper Canada. So you can enjoy that as well. We look well, forward to uh, it. I must tell you, uh, I'm more than willing to take the drive to Niagara on the Lake just because it's Niagara on the Lake. If you have an event you'd like me to appear at in person, I'm more than happy to come down. And I found a reasonably priced place to stay, the Canterbury Inn over on, can't remember the street. Mary, is it that one? Uh, yeah, it's on Mary. That's right. And it's very reasonable. The people are very nice and it doesn't cost an arm and a leg. So uh, Phyllis, my friend on Gate Street, told me about it. And I, I'm a big fan now that I can come and stay overnight and not pay an arm and a lake so uh, uh more than happy to come so seriously consider that uh, uh standing a uh, willingness to come down if you have an event i'm more than happy to come wonderful thank you brian hey sarah okay, I'll, I'll stop recording here